It is. Oh, everybody awake now? Um, it's all, it is so much fun to hear those kids get up here and sing. Um, the story didn't have a happy ending for some of the people and some of the people it did, but um, it was, it's fun to see the kids get up here and sing. And you never know what you're going to get when the kids get up and do whatever they're going to do. You never know because they're going to be kids. And I think they did a fantastic job this morning. Um, yeah, give them another hand as they're going out. They, they did an awesome job. Here, kitty, kitty, kitty. I don't, I got to find that verse. I don't, don't remember seeing that verse, but you know, it's, it's, um, I'm glad that our, in our, in this church, everybody fits into the ministry somewhere. If you have a heart to serve God, there's a place to serve God. And, uh, all the way down to four years old there. Um, if you want to, if you want to do something for God, the doors are wide open and we want you to step forward and do that. So, uh, thanks again, kids. We really do appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to Luke chapter one with me. Um, I'm going to change gears here from here, kitty, 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 to back to Christmas. Um, but Luke chapter 1, and we'll uh, go with, uh, start in verse 26 this morning. But it is officially uh, Christmas season. People are decorating the lighting of the Christmas tree ceremonies that happen in, even with government um, is going on. Christmas parties are being scheduled and Christmas plays are being performed. It's Christmas season. Once you get into December, it all opens up. So we're going to follow suit. Uh, at Renew. It's Christmas season and we're going we're gonna to follow suit. We're just going to play right along with the Christmas season here, but we're going to do it biblically. Um, we don't want anybody to get so caught up in the, events of, in the events of the season that we forget about the purpose of the season. So we're going to go ahead and move biblically uh, through this also. Um, Jesus Christ is the reason we celebrate Christmas and, and we can't let that go. Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. It's not all the other things that are displayed out there, and we can't miss that. But one of my favorite parts about Christmas, outside of the true meaning of Christmas, is the gift-giving part. Hey, could, could you guys turn that down a little bit? I'm getting some feedback right here. I don't know if anybody else is, but I, I can hear me, and that's just disturbing. So thank you very much. Um, so... Gift giving, that's, I love that part of Christmas. And I, I don't know, I, hopefully everybody in this room loves that part of Christmas. Some people like the gift giving that the other people do towards them, which that's fun also. That's, I mean, of course, and everybody likes to receive a gift. But I do like that gift giving aspect of Christmas, especially when it's not out of obligation. You know, when, you, when you're the two days before Christmas, somebody gives you a gift and then you, you think, oh, thank you, I'll be bringing yours soon. I, I forgot to bring yours, and then you run to the store and hurry up and, you know, go into panic mode, buy something that you hope they like and give it to them. Yep, yep, just been sitting at home all this time, and I didn't forget you at all. You know, that awkward obligation kind of feeling. Um, nobody likes that feeling, but I do like it. I like the gift giving when it's not out of obligation, but just to give somebody a gift. I love that aspect of Christmas. I actually get more out of seeing my kids, the looks on their faces when I give them gifts, than I, I enjoy receiving a gift myself. I just love that because they glow when they get a gift. Me, I don't know what happens when I get a gift, but I am appreciative of it. Uh, I am. I just don't, I don't have that childlike glow that they have. I love watching them open up their presents. Everyone likes to receive gifts, but there's just something about being able to give that makes Christmas special to me. And hopefully it does that to, with everybody else also. It is actually so much fun that it's become a game at most Christmas parties. Most Christmas parties consist of a gift exchange. You know, most of them do. Because it's, it's, it's just a blast to give presents. So it's actually become a game at a lot of parties. There may be a price limit. There may not be a price limit. But you guys understand that at most Christmas parties, there's going to be a gift exchange of some kind. Somebody's walking out with a gift. Some people even have extra gifts hidden in the back just in case you forgot yours. That way you can still be involved in the gift giving process because it's so much fun. But we can't allow ourselves to forget the reason that we give gifts in the first place. And it's because it reminds us of the gift of Jesus Christ. And we can't, we don't want to lose that. When we fail to keep Christ as the center of Christmas, then we fail to have Christmas. And that's just as bold as I can say that. If you fail to keep Christ at the center, as the center of your Christmas, then you miss Christmas. It's just, you missed it. We're all familiar with the very first Christmas gift. 
<clears throat> Every one of us are. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. The first Christmas gift, we are all familiar with that, is Jesus Christ. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. And Jesus was that first Christmas gift. But how many of us are familiar with the first gift exchange? That's what I want to talk about this morning, is the, is the gift exchange itself. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. You're all thinking in your head, where was the first gift exchange in the Bible? Well, I, I want to go ahead and bring that up here for the Christmas gift exchange. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26, we'll start reading there. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But, then he, uh, uh, but, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Calls her by name there. That, that ought to calm you down or creep you out one or the other. But he calls her by name here. Says, the angel said unto her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call, call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be the, called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the, whole, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This morning I would like to take the Christmas spotlight and I would like, it to, I would like to move it right over to Mary this week. I want to focus on this person in the Bible. Most people know Mary as the mother of Jesus, but we basically let her story stop right there. We, when somebody mentions Mary... We know that that's the mother of Jesus. But as far as our understanding of who this person was and how deep her story goes, we basically stop right there. Jesus was Mary's son. And that's where our understanding stops. There's so much more to this young lady that God has recorded for us to see. And I want to go through the details of who this lady was. Mary's around 14 years old when she receives the news that she's pregnant. That's how old she was. 14 years old. Now that ought to shake things up in your world pretty good. The teenagers in this room can relate because they understand, they know what age they are right now. Imagine 14 years old and an angel comes up to you and says, hey, great news, you're pregnant. And, she's, and she says, now hold on, I'm a virgin. And like, it doesn't matter, God has given you a child. That's going to that's gonna disrupt some mindset that you're in. You were living a normal life, and now an angel shows up and says, hey, by the way, you get to be the mother of the Son of God. That's an incredible gift, but that will probably shake your world a little bit. She's just a teenager, and God's delivered her a message through, through an angel. In the Old Testament, we see where God uh, speaks through people regularly or speaks to people regularly. He spoke through prophets to deliver his message over and over again. As we read the Old Testament, we'll see Moses, and you can see God talking to Moses. Adam and Eve, you can see God talking to Adam and Eve. In the Old Testament, we have God talking to people a lot, but by the time the New Testament arrives, the people are not accustomed to this. It has been 400 years since God has said anything to anybody. The Old Testament, the pages of the Old Testament, we stop there. And there is a 400-year gap between God talking to somebody in the Old Testament and God talking to somebody in the New Testament. 400 years goes by. So nobody that's alive when we open up the New Testament has ever heard God speak through a prophet or anything like that. They can read the pages of the prophecies, but they didn't have God speaking. No angel showed up or anything. It's called the, we call it the 400 silent years where God just doesn't say anything through that time to anybody. Now God sends an angel to speak to a young virgin girl and shakes her entire world up. 
Well, God's voice is back. God's sending messages back. And guess what? We've got one right here. You're pregnant. Well, that'll make a really good entrance back into the scene, doesn't it? <laughs> like, okay, we couldn't ease our way in here. You know, we couldn't just, you know, hi, how you doing? I'm God. You're, you know, so and so. No, God sends an angel. Hey, go tell her she's pregnant. That'll that'll shake the that'll shake the world up a little bit. There's your introduction to the Christmas story right there. He spoke to Mary by an angel. Mary's engaged to Joseph, and she's kept herself pure. Mary's a virgin. She's kept herself pure. Engagement meant something different than it does now. When they got engaged or betrothed, it was different than when we think of an engagement. We think of an engagement like somebody brings a ring and, you know, they propose to you, now you're engaged. And if things don't work out, just break off the engagement, give the ring back or don't give the ring back, and you just don't get along anymore. You know, that's just, that's, that's how we picture an engagement. But it was different back then. When two people were engaged or betrothed, it was considered binding. A bill of divorcement was needed if they were going to break off the engagement. You would have to get a divorce. Once they were engaged, they were considered married, but they could not, they would not act as a married couple. They would remain virgins until the marriage was solidified. Okay? But they were considered married. That's why you'd have to have a bill of divorcement if you were to break off the engagement. It would still be, it would still be a divorce. They belonged to each other and they were to remain faithful to each other. Now she gets the news that she's pregnant and that the baby was just created in her outside of natural means. Now that's going to be a hard one to sell. Nobody else has had this story. You know, remember that one person a long time ago that this happened to? Well, it looks like it happened to me too. No, she's the only one in the history of the world that this has happened to. That's a hard one to sell. I'm pregnant, but let me, let me defend myself. It's God. <laughs> I, I've been faithful. I'm still a virgin and I'm pregnant, but it's because God gave me this baby. We all clear? That's going to be a tough one to sell. It, it really would be difficult. Mary, Mary's afraid, and we can't really blame her. This is some big news, and she's afraid. Then Gabriel, the angel, tells her exactly what's going on. Look at verse 30 here. It says, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. That's what's going on here, Mary. God's found favor with you. He sees your heart. He knows the character of person you are. And he's pleased. <clears throat> this is what's going on. God has found favor with you. Or you found favor with God. This is all Mary ever wanted. She's a young lady who loves God and wants to serve God. That's, that's what she really wants. That's her heart. Mary's life is about to get rough. She will have to tell her family and friends that she's pregnant and that she's a virgin, which, like I said before, is a tough sell. And people aren't going to believe her, and you can't blame them. You can't blame them. Some people might believe her. Some people may not. <clears throat> Joseph's going to have some questions. And <laughs> you really can't blame Joseph. Okay, now that we're married, we're engaged, I need to tell you something. <clears throat> we're going to have a baby. <laughs> Joseph's going to have some questions, naturally. Everything's going to change. And then we see her response in verse 38. It says, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. She, ex she accepts the gift and the struggle that's going to come with that gift. We a lot of times think of Mary as, you know, God tells her she's going to have Jesus, then she's cool with it, and then she goes forward, and then they lay him in the manger, and, you know, you hear the Christmas music playing in the background, all the angels show up, it's a beautiful nativity scene there, and then we go have lunch. You know, that's, that's just what we visualize. But look at how much goes along with that story. There's a lot happening here. She accepts the gift, and the struggle that goes with that gift. She said, okay, let it be to me according to your word. That's an impressive young lady, just a teenage girl. And she said, okay, whatever you want to do, God, whatever you say, let it be to me according to your word. Mary's story begins to be revealed in scripture, but this is where we usually stop reading right here. So let's read farther. This morning I'd like to follow it through 
and see the gift that Mary gave in exchange for the gift that God gave her. The gift exchange. We know the gift that God gave Mary. It's the same gift that God gave all of us. Jesus Christ came down to die in our place for our sins. We understand the gift that God gave to Mary, but what's the gift that, God, that Mary gave to God in exchange? If you're trying to find a way to give something to God for Christmas, this, mes this message is going to give you a peek at his wish list. So if you're trying to figure out that gift that God wants for Christmas, this is it right here. You're gonna, we're going to open it up and you get to look at God's wish list for Christmas and you'll know what he wants for Christmas and we can all give it to him. This is what he's looking for and I'm just going to kind of give you a peek and you can look at the list and then dip determine whether you're, not, you're going to give him what he's asking for. After Jesus is born, we see Mary and Joseph taking Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to God. In the temple is a man named Simeon who's eagerly waiting to see the promised Messiah. He knows that God's going to send somebody to save the world, and he's just waiting to see this person. Look at Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. Just turn over a page there. Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. It says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon has been faithful to God. And God rewards him by giving him the promise that he will not die until he physically sees the Savior of the world. That's a really awesome gift. Simeon, I'm pleased with you. And you will not die before you see my son. So Simeon is waiting to see Christ. However he's going to show up, I know I'm not going to die until I see him. Then the day arrives. Mary and Joseph walk into the temple and Simeon gets to personally meet the Savior of the world. Now, I love how God includes these details. Look at verse 27 of Luke chapter 2. So, so he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus, brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles in the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Simeon praises God for keeping his promise to him. And he declares that Jesus is the hope and salvation of the world. And Mary and Joseph are standing there just listening to him talk about their son. Like, why? What is going on? This is a big story in Mary's life. Joseph takes care of Jesus as he was his son, but Jesus is not Joseph's son. Jesus is God's son. But Joseph takes care of him. And they listen and hear these words that Simeon says about Jesus. He's the hope and salvation of the world. And they marveled at the words that he said. Then Simeon turns to Mary and breaks some difficult news to her. And this sparks the gift exchange. Look at verse 34. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon is speaking of the fact that this little baby that she's holding will one day be killed. He will one day die. And when they pierce that spear through his side, it will be as a sword piercing through your soul, Mary, because this is your boy. This is your kid. And all of you mothers can relate to that right there. Uh, your fathers can do the same. This is my kid. You know, if this happens, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cut through me. Simeon says, that day is coming, Mary. And it will be like a sword piercing through your own soul also. Think about this. <clears throat> Mary is the only person that was with Jesus from his birth to his ascension back to heaven. She's the only one that got that. She was there the day he was born, and she was there the day he went back to heaven. She's the only one. She got to see the whole story. And that's a really awesome gift. Mary was an actual young lady. 
And she watched her son grow up and be rejected by many and mocked and eventually killed. Mary carried an incredible burden. That Try to put yourself in her shoes just for this morning. Just try to put yourself in her shoes. That's an incredible burden. And she accepted the gift along with the struggles that were going to come with that gift. She said, whatever, whatever you say, Lord, let it be to me according to your word. She could have walked away from him, but she was willing to walk beside him all the way. Well, it was her kid for one. That was her son. But knowing the struggle that was going to come with that relationship, she decided to stay by his side the whole time. We have to get to the point where we recognize that this is not just a story that we read about, but this was actually a historical event in the world's history. Mary was actually a young lady who was chosen to give birth to the Son of God. This isn't just a Christmas story. This really happened to this 14-year-old girl. She's around 14 years old. This really happened to her. This was something in the world's history that did happen. It's not just a story. She took on this gift. She said, okay, I'll take the struggles that go with it, God. Mary had a connection that we should all strive to have. <clears throat> she saw the angel that came. Gabriel spoke to Mary personally. She got to see the angel, and she knew this was a miracle. It's hard to explain it any other way. She knew this was a miracle. She knows she's a virgin and she's pregnant. She saw an angel show up. She knows this is a miracle. So she got a glimpse of what Jesus left behind to come to earth. She got to see the angel. She got to see the glory. She gets to see the character of her son. So she gets a glimpse of what Jesus left behind in order to come to this world for her. On top of that, she got to see what he traded it for. She watched as he showed love and kindness to other people only to be rejected and ridiculed. She got a glimpse of what he left, and then watching his life, she gets to see what he traded it for. That's a bad trade. That's a really bad trade. She watched as people were unthankful as he continued to heal them. Remember the ten lepers? Only one came back to thank him. The other nine just went to live their life after they were healed of leprosy. She watched as people were unthankful even after he healed them. She was able to witness the religious powers of the day plot to kill her son. She got to see that. They just want to kill him. They just want to crucify him. And I'm, I'm listening to all this happen. They want to kill him, but he's God. He's the son of God, and he came for all of us, and all you want to do is put him on a cross. She would have been there for the trials that he was put through, and false witnesses were brought against him. She got to see as they lied about him and accused him of things that were not true. And she stood there and exposed herself to a brutal murder, knowing him in a more in intimate way than anybody else. She got to watch him get brutally murdered. Mary understood what Jesus gave up and what he took on for her sake. Mary would have had a difficult time knowing what Jesus came for and watching him continually love the very people who hated him. That would be tough as a parent. I watch you love these people over and over and over again. You truly love them and you're kind to them and you heal them and you, you tell them that you love them and most of the population hates you but you still love them. That would be a rough thing to watch as a parent. You'd be proud of your son that still burn inside. You know, no, don't hang out with them anymore. <laughs> Just don't hang out with them anymore. But I love them. Yeah, but they're not good. <laughs> they're not an in good, they're a good influence. But I can't be influenced because my focus is here. So I'm going to love them. That'd be a tough thing as a parent to watch. This was her son. She held him as a baby. This is a historical event. This isn't just a Christmas story. This was her son. But she had a gift to exchange, and she wasn't going to miss out on giving that gift. She was going to give a gift back to God, and she wasn't going to miss out on that opportunity. So here's the question. What can you give God more than he already has? Well, let's try to think of that for a second. We're going to give a gift in exchange for the gift that God gave us. God sent his son to die in our place. That's an incredible gift. We're never going to match it. 
Okay? We're never going to outgive God. But what do you give God in return for what he gave us? So what do you give God more than he already has? And what can you give him which he could not just create on his own? He is God. So what do you give the guy who already has everything? What do you give him? The secret to choosing the perfect gift for someone is knowing who they are. You, otherwise, it's just a gift. Oh, thank you for another tie. I don't wear them, but thank you for the tie. You know, otherwise a gift comes across like that, okay? But the, the secret to giving the perfect gift is knowing the character of the person that you're going to give that gift to. That'll give you a good idea of what that gift would be to make it just right for that person, their interest and their personality. That's how you give the perfect gift. Mary definitely got a front row seat on that information. Okay, she, got, she, know, she knew exactly what he would want. She would have known his favorite color. She would have known his favorite meal. And she would have known all about the things that he valued most. She watched him grow up. There may have even been a day when somebody came up to him and asked the question that every child gets asked at some point. Jesus, what do you want to be when you grow up? Every kid's asked that question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Can you imagine if somebody came up to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, what do you want to be when you grow up? Can you imagine what his answer would have been like? Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm certain his answer would have gone something like this. I want to be humble. I want to be willing. And I want to be what my father wants me to be. That would be something along the line of what Jesus would answer to that question. And maybe somebody would have stopped him and said, you know, Jesus, those are all really good qualities, but what do you want to be as far as status goes? Like, do you want to be a fireman? Do you want to, you know, that, the status. What status do you want to be when you grow up? And he probably would have said something like this. I want to be the greatest in the kingdom. Now, that might have hit you all wrong there. Like, oh, hold on, Jesus was humble. He probably wouldn't have answered anything like that. I bet you his answer would have gone something like that. I just want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And later on in Matthew, Jesus tells us exactly what that means. Let me read that to you. Matthew 18, verse 1. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say unto you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore... Whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What do you want to be, Jesus? I want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? Humility is the answer. I just want to be humble. I want to be willing. I want to be humble. And I want to do what my Father wants me to do. And by the way, Jesus is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You're never going to see humility at a greater level than what Jesus did. Knowing this about Jesus, Mary knew exactly what to give God for a gift exchange. She knew him. She knew his character. She knew exactly what he would want. She knew that God didn't want anything more. If he wanted something more, he could just create it. He doesn't want something more. So Mary gave him something that he wanted with all of his heart. She gave him less. And I want to explain what that means, but it was the perfect gift for God. He doesn't need more. If he needed something more, he'd have it. What he needs is less. So God went, or Mary decides, I'm going to give him what, exactly what he wants. I want to give him what he's looking for. So she gave him less. She yielded herself to be the maidservant of the Lord. I'll be the servant. She didn't want to give him some great accomplishment that she had done. That's not what she was trying to give God. Look at how great I am. Look at the gift I gave you and how great it is. Look at the accomplishment I'm offering you, Jesus. That'll, that's what I want to give you. No, she didn't want to give him more. She actually wanted to give him less. She didn't want to give him something that would bring the focus back to her as the giver. She, that's not what she was looking for. She realized that when she gave something in exchange for the gift God gave us, that less is more. Less is more. John 3.30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. Think about this. God's got to become everything. And I need to decrease in my own status. 
and let him be everything. So God, what I'm going to give you is actually less. I'm not going to be focused on me. I'm going to be focused on you. You don't need anything more, but you do need something less. And I need to get out of the way. And in this equation, you need less of me and more of you. So she found the perfect gift to give God. He doesn't need more. He needs less. James, uh, James 4, 6 says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Mary discovered the perfect gift for the gift exchange. And that's the perfect gift. God didn't want more of Mary. He wanted her to make more room in her life for him. Now that's a good gift. That's a good gift exchange. You humbled yourself and became flesh. Think about that gift. God who did not, he could have just wiped us all out and started over. And honestly, if any of us were him, we probably would have done that over and over and over again. I don't know what version of this world we'd have right now, but it would not be in the single digits. I'll start over again and again and again and again. But God, he never, he never forsook us. From day one, he never started over. He loved us. Adam and Eve sinned. And God loved them. He was not just going to wipe them out. He's going to give them a chance to repent and come back to him. So Mary sees, Mary sees the perfect opportunity to give God a gift that he would want. If he's not willing to give up on me, and he has to come to this earth to die for me, then he needs less of whatever is causing that to happen. He needs less of me being in the way and more room for him to step in and be part of the equation. Mary was determined that he must increase, she must decrease, and less is more. So she gave God less for Christmas. That's a, that's a good gift. And honestly, it wasn't something that we would naturally run to. You know, I'm gonna, you know what can I give you for Christmas? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you less. You know, but it's a perfect gift for God. Like, can you, can you just... Humble yourself and step out of the way so I can do something? Can there be more room for me? Can you make less room for what you want and more room for what I want? And Mary says, yes. That's a good gift. I know his character. He wants less. He doesn't need more. So I'm going to give him less. Her life needed to be less about her and more about him. And Mary carried an incredible burden throughout her life. She knew that that little boy that she gave birth to on that Christmas day was going to die. That's a burden when you know your child is going to die. It's not, only, it's not a guess. You're not just watching his health to make sure it's okay. It was prophesied. God said, my son is going to die. And Mary says, okay, the son I gave birth to, I'm going to one day see him die. That's a tough, tough burden to carry. She knew that she was going to lose him. That really happened. It's not just a Christmas story, but she knew she was going to lose him. But she knew that the reason she was going to lose him is because he did not want to lose her. The reason Jesus died and went through what he went through is because he wasn't willing to lose us. It's still our choice whether we accept him or not, but he at least did everything he could so we could choose. You can choose. The price has been paid. You can choose. And now it's up to us. Are we going to choose him and understand that the price has been paid? It's just a gift. And we can accept it. Or we can choose to ignore him, reject him, and then we've got to pay that price ourselves, and that is going, dying going to hell. Complete rejection of God means you get everything that God's not. The Bible says that God is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, grace. You've got all these attributes of God. So if you choose to ex reject what God is, then you're only left with what God is not. And you spend an eternity with no love, no joy, no peace, no patience, kindness, goodness, grace. You take all those features that we love in life, and you get to spend an eternity without God. 
That is what it is. So God, instead of letting us just fall into that scenario, he paid the price. That was an incredible gift. So Mary says, if, if you're going to give that much, then I'm going to give so much less of me so there's so much more room for you. I want to give you the perfect gift. She knew that the little boy she gave birth to on that first Christmas was going to die. She understands this. She knows that he doesn't want to lose her, and that's why she's going to lose him. Thirty-three and a half years after that Christmas night, Mary stood at the foot of the cross and watched her son die for her sins. Her story goes on a little longer than just the Christmas story here. She actually got to stand at the foot of the cross and watch Jesus die for her sins. John 19, 25 says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. That day was like a sword piercing through her soul. She served him knowing that he wasn't always going, it wasn't always going to be easy. She knew it wasn't going to be easy. She knew that day was coming. And Mary, we always picture Mary with the Christmas. We picture this right here. Mary holding a baby, maybe around a manger, shepherds, star, Joseph standing by her. The nativity scene, we picture that when we think of Mary. But do we, do we picture the lady that's probably down on her knees sobbing uncontrollably because they watch her son. She's watching her son be brutally murdered because of her own sins. Do we picture that when we picture Mary? Because that's part of her story. That was part of what she got to see. That day was like a sword piercing through her soul. She served him knowing that it wasn't always going to be easy, but she was going to serve him anyway. It wasn't about her. It was about less of her and more of him. Fifty days after Jesus rose from the grave, we see a group of people gathered in Jerusalem waiting for the comforter that Jesus said he would send. When Jesus said, Jesus said he was going to go back to heaven, but he was going to send the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Holy Spirit indwells you. He, he decided to make you his home. I mean, when I think of me personally, I'm thinking, man, that was a... That was a that was a step down there. <laughs> the Holy Spirit has heaven. He's got that and he decides to live in me and, and work through me. Jesus says, when I go to heaven, I'm going to send the comforter. And when you get saved, he's going to live inside of you. And he's never going to leave you and never going to forsake you, but he's going to live inside of you. Mary wasn't about to miss this. She wasn't going to miss that. Because it says, the disciples went to the upper room, and look who shows up with them. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Mary's story goes into Acts, in the book of Acts. <coughs> Jesus dies. She knows he came back to life. He goes to heaven, and Mary follows those disciples. <laughs> He said he was going to send you a comforter, and I'm going to be there when he shows up. Because right now, I could really use some comfort. I want that comforter too. And Mary follows them. She was not going to miss it. Comfort's what she definitely needs right now. Her son just went back up to heaven. What an incredible story. And she goes to that upper room with the disciples, and she's waiting. Mary is one of the very first people whose heart became a permanent home for the Holy Spirit. That's a really cool story. I'm going to live in you. And he never left her. He never left her. Today, Mary is with Jesus again. She's with her son. They exchanged gifts, and now they're enjoying those gifts together today. Now, that's a cool Christmas story. I truly believe that if Mary could give us all one piece of advice this morning, it would be the same advice that she gave others while she was alive on earth. In John chapter 2, Jesus is at a wedding feast where they run out of wine. Maybe you're familiar with that story. They run out of wine at the wedding feast, and Mary asks Jesus for his help. Uh, Going to need some help, Jesus. After she makes a request to Jesus, she turns and speaks to the, the servants of the house, and she gives them the only piece of advice ever recorded from her lips. This is the only piece of advice that Mary ever gives recorded in Scripture. 
John chapter 2 and verse 5 says, And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. That's the only advice recorded that Mary ever gave. Whatever he says to you, do it. In that one statement, Mary lets everyone get a glimpse of Jesus' Christmas list. <laughs> this is what he wants. This is what he wants for Christmas. Trust him and love him back. Whatever he says, just do it. Humble yourself. He must increase. We must decrease. He's the master or the servant. He's God. He's the creator or the creation. The only piece of advice I recorded that Mary ever gave was whatever he says to you, do it. Obey him. Sometimes life gets extremely hard for all of us. Sometimes life gets hard. Mary knew all about that. Believe me, Mary knew all about that. She understood how life gets hard. But she also knew what Jesus left in order to come to this earth. And she knew what he ended up trading it for. Mary had determined that no matter how difficult life got, she was always going to yield herself as the maidservant of the Lord. I don't care how, life, how hard life gets. I don't care if things don't go my way. I don't care if I have to experience loss, which I know is coming, and I'm going to experience loss, but I'm going to serve him. And I'm going to yield myself, and I'm going to humble myself to him. Even in the tough times, I'm going to do it because he must increase, and I must decrease. So God, here's my gift exchange. Less of me, so there can be more of you. I'm going to be less. That's, that's my gift. I'm going to give you less. And God was pleased with that gift. That's an amazing gift exchange. <laughs> Mary had determined that her life would be served for God. God gave Mary more than she could have ever imagined. And Mary, in turn, gave God a yielded heart. <clears throat> less of me, more of you. Merry Christmas. That's a gift that you can open that God can't open. And God doesn't want to open a gift. He wants you to open the gift. You open the gift and show me what you gave me. And when we open our heart to God and we are completely yielded to God and he sees that humility we say, yes, God, sometimes life is hard and there's things I don't like down here. There's people that I'm trying to love and maybe they're not lovable back. Maybe I'm trying to go through life and finances aren't working out right. Maybe my, my situation just keeps getting lower and lower, but then I keep thinking about the situation that you came to. Your situation got really low. So no matter what happens to me, let it be to me according to your word. So I'm going to open up my gift, and that's my heart. And you look inside and say, are you accepting, are you accepting, is my gift acceptable to you? Are you happy with what I'm giving you? And God looks down and he says, I don't see a whole lot there. <laughs> That's perfect. Because there's a lot of room for me to work. There's less of you and more of me. I love that gift. If you're looking for something to give back to God for all he's done for you, this is the perfect gift exchange. This is what he wants. This Christmas, what are you giving to the birthday boy? We give gifts to each other at Christmas, but what about the one whose birthday we're celebrating? We wouldn't dare go to another person's birthday party and not show up with something and then say, give, what gifts do you have for me? We wouldn't go to their birthday party and say, hey, let's give each other gifts, but don't give the birthday boy anything. We wouldn't be invited to another birthday. <laughs> it wouldn't work like that. But at Christmas... <laughs> That's the birthday of Jesus Christ. Shouldn't we give him a gift? Shouldn't we be offering him something? He gave us a gift. Now it's time for the gift exchange. And he wants you to open it. You open it and show me what you gave me. And we open that heart. And when he looks in there and sees not a whole lot of you and room for a whole lot of him, he says, now that's perfect. That's perfect. 
If you're looking for something to give back to God this Christmas for everything that he's done for you, this is the perfect gift exchange. Stand with me this morning.